Welcome to this one hour English vocabulary lesson. Today, you're going to learn the 50 most common phrasal verbs in English. Because this video is very long, what I've done is I've divided it into five different parts. So you'll learn 10 phrasal verbs, You'll understand what that phrasal verb means, how to use it in your speech, and you'll see some practical example sentences. So you'll learn 10 phrasal verbs and then you'll complete a quiz. So you'll repeat that five times. So by the end of this lesson, you'll complete five quizzes and you'll learn 50 new phrasal verbs. How awesome is that? Of course, I'm Jennifer. Welcome back to J-Force English Training, your place to become a fluent, confident English speaker. Now let's get started. Number one, to ache for, to ache for. This is a very nice romantic phrasal verb. Now we really use this in the context of a romantic relationship. So make sure you use that appropriately. And to ache for something or someone is when you really, really want that something or someone. For example, he was lonely and aching for love. So this is perhaps a little more of a poetic phrasal verb. You will probably hear it in novels, stories, movies, TV. He was aching for love. So maybe you won't use that in your vocabulary, but you'll likely hear it in romance movies or romance novels. Now you may be more likely to use ache for someone. Let's say your husband is overseas on a business trip and he'll be gone for two or three weeks. You might say, I'm aching for my husband. So if you're talking to your friends, your family, even your colleagues, you could say, oh, I'm really aching for my husband. He's been gone for two weeks already. Number two, to beef up. This is a fun one. When you beef something up, you make it stronger or more important. Now we do use this in the context of bodybuilders and they can beef themselves up, become more muscular. So you can use that in a fitness context, but we also use this in more of a business context, perhaps surprisingly, because you might say, I need to beef up my resume. I need to make my resume stronger or more important. I need to beef up my communication skills, for example. Number three, to make up. And in this context, we're talking about to make up with someone, with someone. To make up with someone is when you forgive someone after an argument or a dispute. In a family context, young kids argue a lot, right? And older kids too. But you might say to your son, your daughter, you need to make up with your sister. You need to make up with your brother. You need to make up with your cousin or a friend. And you list a specific person, which means you need to forgive that person. Stop being angry at that person. Stop fighting with that person. So we definitely use this in a social context, a family context, but you can absolutely use this in a professional context. Coworkers fight as well. There are disagreements in companies. So you might say to one coworker, Sally, you need to make up with Mark. You work on the same team. You have to get along. You need to make up with each other. Number four, to nail down. This is when you understand the exact details of something or you get a firm decision on something. So let's say you're planning a conference and you have a general idea of the conference. It will take place in summer. It will be on this general topic or theme. But when are the exact dates? What specific topics? 
who specifically will be the keynote speaker, who specifically will be presenting, who will you hire to cater the conference. You need to nail down those details. So you need to either understand the exact details or you need to make a firm decision on who's going to cater when the conference will exactly take place. So that's a very useful phrasal verb and you can use it in a business context or a social context. Number five, to open up. When you open up to someone, you talk very freely about your feelings or your emotions, things that make you quite vulnerable, things you probably don't share with everybody. For example, after years, she finally opened up about his death. So for many years, there was this tragic death perhaps, and she didn't really talk about it. She didn't talk about her feelings about the death. But then after years, she opened up. She started talking freely about how she felt, the circumstances, how she's dealing with it, those types of things, her inner feelings and emotions. Now notice I didn't use to someone. I could say she opened up to her family about his death. So you have about and then the specific topic and to and the specific people. You'll commonly hear people say, I've never opened up to anybody like this before. If someone says that to you, they're basically saying they feel very comfortable around you. They feel like they can share their inner thoughts, feelings, emotions. And that's a very positive thing. It shows you have a very close relationship. Number six, to slip into something. Now this is when you quickly put on a piece of clothing. So this is a very specific phrasal verb. It's only used with clothing. Now, for example, this shirt is quite pretty, isn't it? But let's be honest, it's not the most comfortable shirt. So after I'm done recording this video, I'm going to slip into a t-shirt. I'm going to put on a t-shirt. Or if it's first thing in the morning and you're in your house coat, but then you hear your doorbell, you might quickly slip into some sweatpants and answer the door. So it's simply another way to say put on. Number seven, to stand by something. When you stand by something, it's used to show that you still support or believe something. So I might say we stand by our opinion that interest rates need to increase. So that's my opinion, that's my belief. Interest rates need to increase. I stand by that. I still support that, I still believe that. So you'll hear this a lot from people in power, politicians, executives in business. They'll have an opinion, have a belief, and then they'll state, I stand by that. To let you know they still believe that specific opinion. Do you stand by that and if so, why? Uh, I stand by that. Uh, yes, I stand by that. And the reason simply is, now we also use this with stand by someone. When you stand by someone, it means that you support someone, usually when something negative has happened. So let's say that your coworker was accused of stealing from the company, but you know your coworker didn't do it. You might say, I stand by her, I stand by her, which means you're going to support her in this difficult time. Number eight, to wind down, to wind down. This is an excellent phrasal verb because it means to relax after a busy or stressful day. So you might say, I always read at the end of the day to wind down. To help me wind down, I always read at the end of the day, or I go for a walk after work to wind down. So it just means to relax, but it's another way of saying it, and it implies that you were very busy or stressed out, to wind down. Number nine, to zone out. This is when you stop paying attention for a short period of time. 
Now we've all done this, especially when we were kids in school and your teacher's talking and you just zone out. Now generally people zone out because they don't have interest in a particular topic. For example, whenever people talk about sports, I zone out. I just stop listening and I start thinking about something else in my own head and I'm not listening to the conversation about sports. I zone out. I stop paying attention. But then when the conversation changes, I'll pay attention again. So it's always for that short period of time. Number 10, to turn in. This is a very useful phrasal verb because it simply means to go to bed. It's another way of saying to go to bed and it's very common. So of course you can say, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. But you can also say, I'm tired, I'm going to turn in. I'm going to turn in. And it's extremely commonly used, so I suggest you use it. You can use it as a suggestion. Hey, it's getting late and you have that job interview tomorrow. You should turn in. You should go to bed. Or you can use it in question form as well. What time did you turn in? What time did you go to bed? Are you ready for your first quiz? So here are the questions. Of course, hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play, and I'll share the answers. So you can go ahead and hit pause now. Here are the answers. Go ahead and hit pause and figure out how you did. How did you do on the quiz? Make sure you share your score in the comments below and let's continue on with the next group of phrasal verbs. Phrasal verb number one, to act on. This simply means to take action, so to act, but you act on specific information, advice, or recommendations that you've received. For example, the manager acted on the findings of the report. So of course, in this report, there's lots of information and advice, and if you act on that information, the manager acted on the findings of the report. Or in a meeting, you might suggest to your coworkers, we need to act on the recommendations. We need to take action. Outside of the workplace, you might say, we need to act on the advice from our financial analyst. So they gave you some advice, you need to act on it. Number two, to bargain for. To bargain for, this is when you expect something to happen, but that something is usually negative. So you expect something negative to happen. Now, Notice the sentence structure here because we most commonly use this phrasal verb in the negative form. We hadn't bargained for such a high interest rate. So it's saying we didn't expect. Or you could say we hadn't bargained for so many people at the conference. So this is a great expression that you can use, but I recommend using it in the negative. Number three, to opt in. When you opt into something, it means you become a member of something. So if you're a new employee at the company, they might have certain things that are membership based, such as the pension plan, the healthcare plan, or other insurance plans, maybe even some committees. And if you want to be a member, you need to opt in. For example, as a new employee, you need to opt into the insurance plan. Now the opposite of in is out. So if you don't wanna be a member, you can opt out. So for example, new employees are automatically added to the insurance policy. If you don't wanna be a member, you need to opt out you need to opt out. Number four, to play down. This is a great phrasal verb. It means to make something seem less important or less serious than it really is. For example, the government tried to play down the scandal. 
So they had this scandal and they want to make it seem less important or less serious. They try to play it down. Or I could say the documentary played down his divorce. So there's this documentary on this person who got divorced and they're trying to make it seem less serious or less important than it really was in reality. And that's what you need to keep in mind. In reality, the situation was more serious, but the documentary played it down. Ah, it wasn't that big of a deal. Number five, to drop out. When you drop out, this is specifically used when you quit a course or you quit an entire program, a school program. So if you're pursuing a degree and you quit, then you drop out. Now, interestingly, Bill Gates dropped out of college to start Microsoft, and we know how successful that was. So although it might seem negative that you drop out, you quit, Maybe not always the case. Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, also dropped out of college to start Facebook. I'm not encouraging you to drop out, but it's not always a negative. And you can also use this for a specific course. For example, I think I'm going to drop out of calculus. It's too difficult. I'm going to quit calculus. Number six, to cut back. This is when you spend less, you do less, or you use less of something. This is very commonly used by governments or companies. The government has announced plans to cut back on defense spending by 10%. Now notice I said on. If you specify the something, defense spending, you need to use the preposition on, cut back on. Cut back on defense spending. I could also just say the government announced plans to cut back. In that sense, it's just reduce, reduce spending, spend less, and then you have to clarify, well, cut back on what? Now we frequently use this as advice to someone. Let's say you told me, Jennifer, I drink 10 sodas a day. I would say, whoa, you should cut back. You should consume less. That's too much soda. You should cut back. Number seven, to sit in on. This is a great business phrasal verb. It's used specifically in the context of a meeting. And when you sit in on a meeting, it means you attend a meeting, but you only attend that meeting as an observer. So you're not going to participate, you're not going to present, you're not going to ask questions, you're just going to attend as an observer. So if there's a really interesting meeting at work, but you're not directly related to the subject matter, you might ask the organizer, is it okay if I sit in on the meeting today? And which means you're just going to attend to listen, to receive the information. You're not going to participate. Or if you're planning a sales meeting, you might say, it would be useful to have someone from accounting sit in on the meeting. So someone from accounting is just going to be there to absorb the information, but you don't expect them to participate or present anything. So very useful phrasal verb in a business context. Number eight, this is a fun one, to whip up, to whip up. This is very specific because it's used with food and it's used when you make food quickly. So you make yourself breakfast, lunch, dinner, a snack, it doesn't matter, you make any type of food, but you do it really quickly. So you might say, oh no, I'm running late, I need to whip up my breakfast. I need to make my breakfast really quickly. Or let's say you have some guests come over unexpectedly and you want to serve them something. You might say to your husband, give me a few minutes to whip up some appetizers. I'm going to make some appetizers really quickly. So it's a great phrasal verb that you can add to your daily vocabulary. 
Number nine, to dress up. I love this phrasal verb. To dress up is when you wear more professional or formal clothing, usually for a specific occasion. So if you're going out for a nice dinner, maybe it's someone's birthday or an anniversary, you would dress up. You would wear more formal or professional clothing than you normally would. Or let's say you have some really important guests coming into your office, some VIP guests. Well, you might dress up. If you normally wear just a t-shirt, well, you might put on a dress shirt, maybe even a suit with a tie. Or if you're going to a wedding, of course, that's a great opportunity to dress up, to wear more formal clothing. Now, we often use this in question form. If you're invited to a dinner or a party, you might ask, do I need to dress up? Do I need to wear more formal clothing? And they can reply back and say, no, it's informal. There's no need to dress up. And number 10, to get at, to get at something. When someone is getting at something, they're trying to explain or express something specific. We commonly use this in question form. Let's say your coworker is talking to you and they're talking about a meeting that you have, but you're not really sure what they're trying to express to you, what they're trying to explain. You could say, I'm not sure what you're getting at. I'm not sure what you mean. I'm not sure what you're trying to explain. I'm not sure what you're getting at. Now we also use this when we're trying to explain something and the explanation isn't going too well. And then we can say, what I'm trying to get at is we need to cut back. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is, and then you state what you mean, what you're trying to explain. Are you ready for your second quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, you can hit play and see the answers. Here are the answers. Hit pause and you can compare your answers to see how well you did. Awesome job with that quiz. Share your score and let's keep going. Number one, to bear on. This means to be connected to or related to. For example, I don't see how that information bears on this case. So I don't see how that information is connected to or related to this case. I don't see how it bears on this case. Now we can also mean to bear on to mean influence or effect. For example, our relationship didn't bear on my decision. So maybe you have a personal relationship with a contractor and you interviewed many contractors and you chose the one you have a personal relationship with, but you want people to know that personal relationship didn't impact or affect. It didn't bear on my decision. This is a more professional or formal phrasal verb. You'll hear it a lot in the news, in reports, and you can use it a lot in a business context. Number two, to care for something. When you care for something, not someone, something, it means that you like, you have a preference for that something but we commonly use this in the negative. So I could say, I don't care for chocolate cake. I don't care for chocolate cake. It's just another way of saying, I don't like chocolate cake. I don't have a preference for chocolate cake. I don't care for chocolate cake. So it's a, another way if somebody offers you something, you could decline it and simply say, oh, I don't care for chocolate cake. Or if your coworkers are discussing the latest reality TV show and they want to know what you think about it, you could say, I don't care for reality TV. It's just letting them know you don't really like it. It's not your personal preference. 
Number three, to perk up. To perk up means to feel better, happier, or more energized. So think of first thing in the morning, when you wake up, you're still pretty sleepy, right? And what do a lot of people do? They drink coffee. So you could say coffee perks me up. Coffee makes me more energized. Or going for a walk perks me up. We also use this when someone isn't feeling well because they're sick or because something negative happened, like they lost their job, and you might go over with some flowers, with some chocolates, or just with yourself to try to help perk up that other person, to help make them feel better, happier, more energized. So you might say, well, the flowers perked her up, perked her up. The flowers perked her up. The flowers made her feel better, happier, more energized. Number four, to sift through. This is a great phrasal verb. We use this when you have large amounts of information, perhaps a lot of paperwork or files, books, and you need to examine that information to determine what's useful, what's important. For example, after Giuliano quit, I had to sift through all his files. So he has all these files, a lot of information, and you have to examine all of them to determine what you can delete and what's important and you need to keep. Or at home, maybe you're going through your grandmother's photo albums and she has 20, 30 different photo albums. So you might ask your brother, can you help me sift through these photo albums? So you're going to examine them to determine what pictures you want to keep and what pictures you want to get rid of. Maybe you don't know who's in that photo or the quality is really bad. Number five, to wrap up. This is another way of saying to end, to finish, but is very commonly used, especially in a business context. So if you're in a meeting and you're coming to the end of the meeting, you could simply say, all right, everyone, let's wrap up. Let's wrap up for today. Now we commonly add it, Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up for today. It's getting late. Let's wrap it up. The it is the meeting, the meeting, the conference, the event, whatever you're in that you want to finish or end. Or you could say, how should we wrap up the conference? How should we finish or end the conference? You want to do it in a memorable way, right? How should we wrap up the conference? And then you can have a discussion on that. Number six, to flip through. When you flip through a book, a report, a magazine, it means you go through it really quickly. So usually because you want to get a general idea of what that book is about or because you're looking for very specific information. So if you have this report that's 130 pages, but you're looking for a very specific piece of information, you can just quickly flip through it to find that specific part of the report. Or you can do this when you're waiting for a friend to arrive, waiting for a bus. You might flip through a magazine. Just look through it, but you're not really reading anything. You're just flipping through it. You're going through it quickly. Number seven, to draw out. When you draw something out, you make it a lot longer than necessary or needed. So it's usually used in a more negative context. For example, he really drew out his speech. He made the speech a lot longer than it needed to be or that it should have been. So it's more of a negative. It's criticizing the speech. Or you could say, they really drew out the ending of the movie. So maybe you were enjoying the movie, but then the end was just really long, way longer than it needed to be. And you're wondering, when is this movie going to end? They really drew out the end of the movie. 
Number eight, to fall behind. This is a great phrasal verb for both a professional context and a personal context. When you fall behind, it means you make less progress than wanted or needed. Let's say you were off sick from work for over a week. Well, you're definitely going to fall behind. You're going to make less progress than needed because you have a deadline or than just you simply wanted to make because you were gone for an entire week. So often we can fall behind because we're sick or there's a competing deadline or competing project or something going on in your personal life, but it could also simply be because we didn't work hard enough or or fast enough and we fell behind. So in a school context, if you don't spend enough time reading or doing your homework, your exercises, you might fall behind. And if you fall behind, you might have to ask your professor for an extension on a specific assignment. Number nine, to get around. This is when you move from place to place within a specific location. So let's say the location is your city and I'm visiting your city. I could ask you, what's the best way to get around? What's the best method of transportation to go from place to place within your city? So what would you say? What's the best way to get around in your city? And then you can say, oh, Jennifer, you can easily get around on foot, which means you can walk from location to location because your city is very small. Or you might say you definitely need a car to get around. Maybe your city is quite large and spaced out and it's not possible to walk. So you need a car to get around, to go from place to place. So this is an extremely useful phrasal verb when you're a tourist, because you should absolutely know how to get around in the city you're visiting. And finally, number 10, to put off. When you put something off, it means you delay it or postpone it. Now you could put off a meeting. You could delay or postpone a meeting for a specific reason. You might say, let's put off the meeting until next week. So let's delay the meeting until next week. A lot of times people will put off things that are unpleasant, things they don't want to do. For example, I've been putting off asking my boss for a raise. I've been putting off asking my boss for a raise. So notice the gerund verb. I've been putting off asking. I've been putting off cleaning my closet. I've been putting off buying new tires. So you need that gerund verb. And why are you delaying it postponing? Because it's uncomfortable, unpleasant. Are you ready for your third quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, you can hit play and see the answers. Here are the answers. Hit pause and you can compare your answers to see how well you did. You are doing so awesome. Let's keep going, share your score, and let's get going. Number one, to aim at. And you aim at a target. And when you aim at a target, this means to intend to achieve that target. So you just try, <laughs> you try to achieve that target. For example, they're aiming at reducing their costs by 10%. So what's the target in this sentence? Reducing their cost by 10%. That entire clause is the target. Now notice we have a gerund verb. So you can absolutely have a gerund verb. You can aim at doing something, so a gerund verb. You can also use a noun. For example, his slingshot was aimed at his neighbor's garage. So the target in this example is the neighbor's garage. 
and his slingshot was aimed at because that's the target he's attempting to achieve. Number two, this is a great one, to shrug off. When you shrug something off, you disregard it. You don't consider it important. So I could say his insult, an insult is something negative you say to another person. His insult was aimed at me, to use our first phrasal verb. His insult was aimed at me, but I shrugged it off. I said, meh. I don't care. I'm not going to let it bother me. I'm not going to let it hurt me. It's not important. I'm going to disregard it. I'm going to shrug it off. Now notice what I'm doing with my shoulders because this is the verb shrug. You can shrug your shoulders and we generally do that when we want to say meh whatever, we tend to shrug our shoulders. So that's where this expression comes from. Number three, to egg on. That's right, to egg on. This is a fun one. When you egg someone on, you encourage them to do something, but that something isn't in their best interest. For example, let's say a student is arguing with their teacher. Now that probably isn't in the student's best interest to argue with the teacher. But if the other students are saying, yeah, keep going, you're doing great, they're egging him on. They're egging that student on. They're encouraging that student to keep arguing even though arguing isn't in his best interest. Or let's say you're considering doing something a little risky, like jumping off a high cliff when you don't know what's beneath you. And maybe you're not really serious about it, but the crowd eggs you on. Oh, do it, you can do it, you should do it. They're encouraging you, even though it can have a really negative outcome. The crowd egged them on to jump off the cliff. Now, most likely you won't use this in your everyday vocabulary, but you'll commonly hear this on TV, in movies, or when you're reading. So I wanted to share it with you so you're not confused when you see this egg on and you have no idea what they're talking about. Now you do. Number four, to turn down. When you turn something down, it means you reject that something. And we use this in the context of an offer or an invitation. For example, they offered her the job, but she turned it down. She said no to the job. So of course you can say she rejected, but it's very common, more common to say she turned it down. So you can turn down something like a job offer. You can also turn down an invitation from someone else, a social invitation or a romantic invitation. For example, I asked Marissa out, but she turned me down. When you ask someone out, it means you invite them to dinner or a coffee for romantic purposes. I asked Marissa out, but she turned me down. She rejected my offer. Number five, to zoom in or the opposite, to zoom out. If there are any photographers here, you already know what this means because when you zoom in, the object becomes closer. And when you zoom out, the object becomes farther away. And I'm sharing this with you because everyone is meeting on video conference now. When you're having a video conference, you have a camera that's focusing on you. And it's really important you have the correct zoom. You don't wanna to be too close. If you're too close to the camera, you need to zoom out. If you're too far, you need to zoom in. So you might ask a colleague, hey, I can't see you very well, can you zoom in? Or a colleague might tell you, your picture's all blurry, you need to zoom out. So now you know what that means for your next video call. Number six, to wiggle out of. This is a great one. 
When you wiggle out of something, you avoid a situation, a task, a chore, a responsibility that you don't really want to do, and you avoid it in a cunning way. So let's say that tomorrow you're supposed to clean out the garage and you don't really want to, but your wife or your husband, your sister, your brother, whoever wants you to clean out the garage. Now tomorrow, when you're supposed to clean out that garage, maybe you get an urgent phone call just at the right moment and you have to go to work and finish something. But you planned that phone call. You planned that phone call to take place right as you needed to clean the garage. So you did that in a cunning way. So you try to wiggle out of cleaning the garage. So basically when you're asked to do something and then you try to avoid it by creating a scenario where you have another responsibility or maybe a friend asks you to move but you tell them, oh, you have a back injury. So you hurt your back and now you can't help them move. So you try to wiggle out of it. Number seven, to hold up. This is a must know phrasal verb because we use it when you're delayed and you're delayed specifically while you're traveling. This could be traveling on a flight or a train, so a more long distance travel, but it can also just be traveling from your office to another boardroom or from your house to the car. So it can be a very short distance travel or a more longer travel as well. For example, my kids always hold me up when I'm trying to leave. So you're trying to leave the house and then your kids, mom, mom, I need this, help me find that, do this for me, and they delay you. They delay you when you're trying to leave, you're trying to travel. My kids always hold me up. Now, we commonly use this in the passive form. So you might have an appointment that you're trying to get to and you're late, and when you get to that appointment, you can say, sorry I'm late, I was held up. To be held up. I was held up by my kids. Oh, I was held up. Number eight, to hit it off. This is a great one. When you hit it off, it means you have a very positive relationship with someone right from the first time you meet them. So let's say you have a new coworker and the first conversation you have, you realize you have a lot in common, you really like the person, they're nice, they're funny, they like you, the conversation's going really well. You can say, wow, we really hit it off. Hit it off. That it is just our relationship. We hit our relationship off, but we always use it. We really hit it off. Now notice how I also said we. We almost always use this expression with the subject we, my coworker and I, or we. My coworker and I hit it off. I would not say I hit it off with my coworker. That sounds unnatural. We say, we hit it off. Number nine, to get through. When you get through something, it simply means you finish it. But that something is usually a chore or an unpleasant task, something that isn't enjoyable. For example, I have 10 reports I need to get through by the end of the day. I have 10 reports I need to finish by the end of the day. But when I use the phrasal verb get through, it implies there's going to be some effort, some struggle. I don't really enjoy the task. Number 10, to freshen up. When you freshen up, you quickly improve your appearance. So before you go into a meeting or to a social event, you can 
freshen up. You can go into the bathroom and you can brush your hair, you can put on fresh lipstick, you can check your makeup. Now, if you're a guy, maybe you put on deodorant or cologne, things like that. So you quickly improve your appearance. You freshen up. So let's say you're going out for a nice dinner. You might say, oh, just give me five minutes to freshen up. Are you ready for your fourth quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are your answers. So hit pause, take as much time as you need to review the answers. This is your last group of phrasal verbs. Let's get started. To take off. This is used when a flight leaves the ground. For example, tomorrow my flight takes off at 7 a.m. Or what time did your flight take off? So this is another way of simply saying, what time did your flight leave? Now we also use this phrasal verb to talk about a person leaving a location. So you might be at a party and it's getting late, you have an early meeting and you say, Thanks for the party, I'm going to take off. I'm going to leave. Or someone might ask you, what time did you take off last night? What time did you leave? Now take off is also used to remove an item of clothing. So at night, before you get into your pajamas, you take off your clothes, right? Before you get into the shower, you take off your clothes. I can also take off my makeup, which means to remove. Or if it's really hot in the room, you might say, oh, it's so hot in here. I need to take off my sweater. Or when you come into the house, and it's cold out, you take off your jacket, you take off your shoes, you take off your hat, you take off your gloves, take off your sunglasses. So you can take off an item of clothing, but you can also take off accessories like rings, makeup, glasses as well. Take off can also mean to become successful. For example, after I improved my English speaking skills, my career really took off. My career became successful. My career took off. Or I could say overnight, my YouTube channel took off. My YouTube channel became successful. So many different phrasal verbs would take off, but they're all commonly used. So make sure you learn all these individual meanings. To take after someone. When you take after someone, you resemble them in either personality or appearance, and this is most commonly used with family members. For example, it's very common for a son to take after his dad, which means he looks like him. They look very similar. But you might also say, Julie is so funny. She really takes after Uncle Frank. So maybe Uncle Frank is really funny. He's always telling these hilarious jokes. And then Julie is also really funny. She takes after Uncle Frank. So you can use this with personality or appearance. To take apart. When you take something apart, you disassemble it. So it goes from being whole, one complete item, and then you disassemble it into individual parts. So if your car isn't working, you might take apart the motor or take apart the engine to try to figure out what the problem is. You might also take apart a desk or take apart a bed when you're getting rid of it, when you're removing it from your home because it's easier to move when it's in individual parts rather than one big structure. To take back. 
When you take something back, it means that you return a purchased item to the store for a refund. So let's say you bought a pair of shoes at the store, you come home and you realize they don't fit very well or you just don't really like them, well, you can take them back. So you go to the store, you return the shoes and you get your money back. Now, we only use this when you physically go to the store. So with online purchases, we actually don't use the phrasal verb take back. So if you order something from Amazon and you don't like it and you want a refund, we simply say, I returned the shoes I bought from Amazon or I sent back. I sent back the shoes. So just keep that in mind. We only use take back when you physically go to the store. You can also take someone back, which means you reunite a previous romantic relationship. So let's say that Rob and Julie were a couple last year, but then they broke up. They ended their relationship. But then Rob, he begs Julie, please take me back. Please accept me again as your romantic partner. Please take me back. But Julie's friend might say, don't take Rob back. Why would you take Rob back? You shouldn't take Rob back to take on. When you take on a project or a task, it simply means that you accept that project or task. For example, your boss might ask the team, who has time to take this on? Who has time to take on this new project or this new client? And you might say, I can take it on. I can take it on. So you accept that responsibility for that job. You can also take over a responsibility, a project, a task, which means that you assume responsibility from another person. So let's say Julie took on the project, but then Julie decided to go on a three week vacation. So your boss might ask you to take over. So the responsibility goes from Julie to you. Hey Maria, can you take over this project while Julie's on vacation? Or it can be, can you just take over this project? So it can be permanent, it becomes your project permanently, or it can just be a temporary situation while someone is sick or on vacation. To take someone out. When you take someone out, it means you invite them for an activity such as having a meal together or going to the movies together, but you pay for that activity. For example, let's say it's your birthday. Well, your husband, your best friend, your mother, your sister might take you out for dinner, which means they invite you for dinner and they also pay for dinner. That's the important part. Or they might take you out for a nice night at the movies and you go to the movies together or maybe to the amusement park. So you can do other activities, but it's mainly used with meals. So maybe your friend says, why would you take Rob back? Why would you take Rob back? He didn't even take you out for your birthday. Oh, he didn't invite you out for dinner and then pay for that meal. You can take up a new hobby or activity, which means you start that new hobby or activity. So you could tell your friends, I decided to take up karate, which means you decided to start karate lessons as a new hobby or activity. Or your friend might say, I didn't know you took up dancing. I didn't know you started dancing as a hobby or activity. Are you ready for your final quiz? Here are the questions. So go ahead and hit pause, complete the quiz, take as much time as you need. And when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are the answers. So hit pause and review these answers to see how well you did. 
Congratulations, you did it. You have 50 new phrasal verbs added to your vocabulary. Amazing job. Make sure you share all your scores if you haven't already. And if you found this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe. And before you go, make sure you head over to my website, jforestenglish.com, and download your free speaking guide. In this guide, I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. And until next time, happy studying.